so good to be back in Pittsburgh with APC and with all of you. How have you been doing? Come on. Look at you. How many of you are happy for Jeff and Melody Leak and what they are creating for all of us? They are giving us a space to meet. And when I was here yesterday night, I was drinking. Was there someone else drinking? I was drinking from the, from the wells of the Holy Ghost. I was drinking deep. And I was so ministered to. Thank you, Jeff Leak, for being such an awesome friend. And being such a Barnabas. Uh, a, a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and full of faith and a connector and an encourager. Aren't we so many in here that are so thankful for Jeff and Melody Leak and what they have meant to our lives. And he's been my friend for 25 years now. And he promised me that when I would visit APC the 50th times, we would go and have matching tattoos. And this is the 50th time, baby. <laughs> this is the 50th time. So you're not getting away. Sunday afternoon, my friend. I'm going to give you a big pirate ship between your nipples. It's going to be something awesome with a big flag saying APC. What do you guys say? Huh? <laughs> It's happening, it's happening. Huh? Nowadays, even, even church, church boys can get a tattoo. Come on. Huh? This is fantastic. <laughs> I think you can only say these kind of things to a lead pastor when you've been friends 25 years, right? Yeah. Well, uh, Jeff, I don't know. Uh, get a permission from Mel and probably from the church elders. And, you know, we'll see. Yeah, well, I'm so happy to be with you. How many of you am I meeting for the first time? Could you just wave at me? Look at this. Where have you been my whole life? Hello. So I'm the African that they bring in nowadays. I was born in Austria, married a Swedish hot-looking girl. And then I went to Africa when I was 22. And I've been there uh, now almost 30 years serving Jesus. So nowadays I feel culturally I'm probably mostly an African. And then I've been connected to this house coming here to do evangelism and outreaches. And Jeff has been with me in Africa so many times and also over in Europe where I've planted a bunch of churches. But today I've come to wash your feet. huh? All these beautiful church planters and leaders and pastors that are here. I've come with a word from the Holy Spirit and I believe you are going to leave feeling all I want to do is to exalt Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. How many of you know this is not about us? Come on. Jesus never called us to build church. He called us to make disciples. And then he would build his church. Right? So we are all about Jesus. Aren't we? And I love the theme here. Fresh start. Big dreams. But how many of you realize that in order for you to have a fresh start, you often need to crash first? And we don't like to talk about the crash. But I believe we have some people in here that have crashed, right? Maybe that's how you came to Jesus. But I wrote down that without a failure or a crash, there is simply no room for the new. Small human dreams need to die for God's big dreams to be birthed, right? And uh, the first time I crashed, I was 19 going on 20, and I came to Teen Challenge. Many of you know what that is. In Africa, we say a sober house. And I came there, I was a wasted young man. That they yeah, slept with a knife under my pillow that they took from me on the first night I was there. I was afraid of everyone and fought everyone and was paranoid. And, but I crashed. And I found Jesus. How many of you know how beautiful it is to surrender and crash and then getting baptized and buried with Jesus and raised with Jesus and start a new life? Isn't that our gospel? Isn't that what we preach? Then I remember I came to see my mama crash. My mama was an alcoholic for many, many years, lived with drug dealers and drug addicts. And 
I visited the rehab center that Christmas when she had come to, to this place and I could hardly look at her because she had washed her hair and she had her hair put up and she had a nice dress on and every time I looked at her I had to cry. She was so beautiful. <laughs> she was skin and bone but she was sober and she had Jesus in her eyes and uh, Jesus had changed her life. And then my sister crashed and my daddy crashed. I saw my daddy raising his hand. We were hunting together up in the north of Sweden and someone had a guitar and they gave me a guitar and I sang some old Christian hymns and I, everyone was raising their hands and I didn't know really about daddy. He had listened a lot to the gospel but all of a sudden I saw his hand like this. Looked so, you know, he was so out of place. <laughs> he was so weird. But he tried to worship. And later on he told me that he had accepted Jesus in his life. When we crash, something new and fantastic can happen in our lives, right? We like to talk about church plants. And I've planted a bunch of churches myself. And my sons and daughters have planted thousands. But we never talk about what happened on this journey, right? The first church I planted don't exist. Then I built a big center in Stockholm. Jeff was there to preach. We, we ran it until we had 1,100 in attendance. And then there were divisions and heartbreaking things happening. And we had to walk away from it all. These are also part of our journey, right? And these are good things. Because when it happens, the Lord starts to mold us, isn't it? And uh, today when I've been preparing and for the last couple of days when I've been preparing to meet with you, I've been thinking about the Lord's altar. Isn't, isn't that where, where we want to put ourselves, right? We want to carry ourselves in this conference and put ourselves on the altar of God again, isn't it? That's why I came here to, um, <coughs> to Sacred Assembly yesterday to put my life on God's altar one more time. And... Um, I look at the Lord's altar like a potter's wheel, right? The Lord's altar is like a potter's wheel. And I want to read some very familiar scriptures with you before I go into my message here. And I want to take you to Jeremiah chapter 18. And I want to read there from the first verse to six. Do you understand what I'm saying? The accent is not too hard? No. No. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. <clears throat> Go down to the potter's house and there I will give you my message. So I went down to the potter's house and I saw him working, on, working at the wheel. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seems, seemed best to him. And the word of the Lord came to me. And he said, can I not do with you Israel as this potter does, declares the Lord. Like clay in the hand of the potter, so you are in my hand, O Israel. And I brought a beautiful African pottery here today because in Africa we got the most beautiful pottery in the world. And uh, in Africa we use this as a refrigerator. This is where we cool things. But... Uh, this was made by someone, right? Someone shaped it. And uh, I, I had this message here that I, that I <laughs> couldn't shake. First, I wanted to speak about, you know, just fresh starts and big dreams. And, but you see, we're not supposed to dream our own dreams when we come to Jesus Christ, right? We're supposed to die with Jesus Christ. If the kernel is not put in the ground, it remains a lonely kernel. But if it's put in there and it dies, it grows up and it bears fruit. And I think that the story of Jesus is a story about dying, right? And through Jesus' death, we have now 2 billion plus people that are confessing Jesus all over the world. But if Jesus wouldn't have been dying, that would have not have come. And we got to understand that this crashing part of the gospel, this surrendering part of the gospel is really what it's all about and um, 
I wrote down here that the Bible is full of these stories. In the days of Noah, the old was flooded and the world had a rebirth. Joseph, as I heard Aaron was preaching about here, uh, he had to be abandoned, betrayed, falsely accused of rape, doing time before he could save the whole world, right? And in the days of Moses, a whole generation of slave mentality and unbelief had to die in the desert like Jeff was preaching yesterday night to give room for the Joshua generation and the pioneering, conquering faith generation. Ruth had to lose everything to become a mother in Israel. And I think that there is something here that we need to understand. You know, even when we watch the big inventors of our life, uh, uh, you know, of the modern, of the modern, should we say, the last two centuries, uh, centuries of industrialization, for example, your Henry Ford, who designed and built his own self-propelled vehicle um, that led to him founding the Detroit Automobile Company a year, <laughs> a year later only after he had founded it, it went bankrupt. Uh, but that was the best thing that could have happened to him. Because if he wouldn't have gone bankrupt, we would have never had the Ford company. And sometimes we have to understand that we need to go bankrupt for the Holy Spirit to really enter into our lives. Because we need to go bankrupt with our own ambitions. With our own fame, with our own glory. And we need to understand that, that uh, it's, it, 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 this was never about us and it will never be about us. It is about Jesus. It is about his name and his fame and his glory and his transformation. And um, I, um, I heard this story from my father when I was a little kid. I always thought it was in the Bible and I, I've shared it here at Alison Park. I think on a Sunday but I don't think I've ever shared it at an Ignite conference. I thought it was in the Bible when I grew up because it was so holy. Then I became a believer. I'm a first generation believer. And I've looked through Genesis to Revelation. And I couldn't find the story. But my daddy told it like it really was a Bible story. He said when God created the world. He made everyone. Uh, you know. Able to say thank you in their own unique ways. The lions were roaring. The cows were making their sounds. The dogs were barking. I was six years old when daddy told me this story and I was so fascinated by how the humans were singing. But there was one part of creation that couldn't say thank you. It was the trees. They were just standing there. Just waving in the wind. And uh, daddy said it was not fair to the trees because they couldn't clap their hands even if the Bible says so. I've read it but they couldn't clap their hands. They couldn't sing. They couldn't make any noise. Daddy said, it's not always fair. And I cried for the trees like a Greenpeace activist. <laughs> Six years old. What the heck, God? Why couldn't the trees say thank you? And then um, Daddy let me have it for a while. And then he said, but what is a guitar made of? And I said, wood, Daddy, wood. So where is that coming from? You know. That revelation that only a six-year-old can have, right? What is drumsticks made of? What is a violin made of? And he just went on and went on and an instrument, a flute. And then he pictured, painted to me a whole orchestra that the human beings had carved out of the trees. And they were now playing a beautiful hymn to God. So God fixed it for the trees, right? And I think it is just like that with us. We can be like dead wood when we end up in the hands of Jesus. But when the carpenter gets us in his hands, right? He starts to carve out an instrument. And the more we crash, the better we become. Just had a guy that crashed in ministry within SOS. And he was crying so bitterly and he said, I failed you. I failed you. I failed you. I said, no, you didn't. Now you finally good material <laughs> you've been so full of yourself and so prideful but now finally 
this God can work with. I don't know if you've crashed yet or if you're about to crash or if you've crashed many times. But I want to say that often when we crash, we become that material that is finally like soft clay in the hands of God. And remember that when God spoke to Jeremiah, the clay was in the hand of the potter when it was marred. And we very seldom think about that when we preach out of Jeremiah. But you are in the hands of God very often when he allows you to crash. Why? Because he has a purpose. There's something that needs to be taken away, a stone or something that needs to be taken out of your life. And he needs to form you into the pottery that he wants you to be. And the more I crash, the closer I come to Jesus and the less it becomes of me and the more it becomes about him, right? And um, I walked in here thinking I, I have to inspire them for big dreams. And how can I do that when you gave me this message, Lord? And I wanted to say that when Jesus called his first disciples and he found Peter and he found Andrew and James and John, what did he say to them? In Matthew's Gospel chapter 4, we read in the New King James Version, version that he said, Come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And I think there's something that we can put an emphasis on here that when we follow Jesus, the making process starts. Peter didn't even know the message, right? He didn't even know what it was all about when Jesus called him. But he knew that when I follow him, he is going to make me into what I was intended to be. And I think that we got to understand that Jesus doesn't call you and me for what we are now. <laughs> because that would be pretty hopeless. But he calls us for what he's going to make of us. You are nothing but clay in his hands. And it's not until you die that his dreams can come forth. I remember when I was persecuted in Sweden. Jeff was around at that time. He brought me to America many times. Talked to our senior here from Nicaragua during the lunch break. And what he is going through in Nicaragua right now. And, and I told him that I was slandered all over national television again and again and again. There were eggs on my windshield when I came to my car. Uh, they wouldn't serve me in the restaurant because I was this dangerous apostolic maniac, right? And they would yell at me in the streets and curse me. If you've never been through that, you've missed something in life. <laughs> because what happened was when I lost 190 co-workers within five months, 190 on staff because you know people say can't be that much smoke without the fire there must be something to this and uh, it was a very humbling humbling time I had to leave the big church I was part of and had to start all over again with 25 people downtown Stockholm and uh, God blessed that church because we were flying under the radar we took no interviews <laughs> before that. We wanted every interview. We wanted to be in every paper. But now we took no interviews. We were just discipling people. Just making disciples. And I think that you need to experience this beautiful thing that is called persecution. Persecution molds the church into what it's supposed to be. Everyone wants the book of Acts, right? Right? signs and wonders but it comes as a package deal signs and wonders and persecution persecution signs and wonders and we need to understand that the lord is allowing some of these things to happen it was not the devil that blew the storm against the ship where jonah was hiding it was god right sometimes you think you are fighting the devil when you are in reality fighting god because you're heading the wrong direction. Sometimes you need to be thrown overboard. And sometimes that brutal goodness which is a big fish. Right? 
God's brutal goodness is a big fish that swallows you alive. <laughs> Chews you and vomits you up on land. And there you are in a pile of vomit and finally you are ready to go to that city. Hallelujah. It's wonderful to crash. Some of you are saying this is narcissistic. This is, this is, this is bad. I don't know what to say about this. this is, can this really be the God? It's the gospel. The gospel is about losing your life. Hallelujah. It is about dying with Christ. For him now to live in us and through us. Hallelujah. For us to live for him that gave himself for us. Right? That's the gospel. And I think we need to understand that if the big things is going to happen in our lives, sometimes even every bone in our bodies needs to be crushed before. Revivals have come that way. I wrote down four points. He breaks and he shapes. He calls and he makes. He prophesies. He magnifies. He puts his magnifying glass on us. He signs and it shines. It's a long process. Well, um, Isaiah 43 in verse 18 and 19 says, Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. I think the hardest thing with us is that we get stuck in the former things and we meditate on what we once had when God wants to take a silver card out of our hand to give us a gold card. Right? He wants to remove something for something new to come. He wants to create new wineskins for new wine to flow. And it's a terrible process in our lives. For we are God's handiwork, right? Right? His heart created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Created in Christ Jesus. When we give our lives to Christ, we become art in God's hands. And God prepares stuff for us in advance. In my German Bible, my mother tongue is German, says that we walk into these things once he has created us. Are you getting hold of it? First, he has to mold you and shape you and beat you and crush you. And then you can walk into those things that God has prepared. Ephesians 2.10. Philippians 1.6 says, I'm confident of this. And I want to say this to each and every one of you. That he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. Until the day of Jesus Christ. I want to say with Samuel that we need to raise our stone of hope. Our Ebenezer. God who helped us yesterday, he will help us today and he will help us tomorrow. You might be in dire straits, you might be in a hole, you might be somewhere you don't want to be. But remember, God has allowed you to be in that hole for a reason. He's a good God. He's a just God. Hallelujah. Some of you may not believe it, but he is. And you think you're fighting the devil, but you are not. He has his hands on you. Sometimes we say, the hand of God is upon that young man. The hand of God is upon, yeah, and I'm always thinking, yeah, yeah. And he will feel them. It's beautiful to have the hand of God on your life, right? But sometimes it hurts terribly when those firm hands crushes you into nothing and you, he has to start all over with you again. We break again and again. I remember that it was not until I was broke in that Teen Challenge home, 20 years old, that they could start to prophesy over me. You will uh, preach more in English than you will in German or in Swedish. You gotta learn English, Johannes, because I got something for you, the Lord says. And I started learning English. I hated English. I thought it was the silliest language in the world. <laughs> but I knew it had to do with the purposes of God. And um, 
there is this story that I love so much and I've shared it many times when I've preached the gospel and it's a South European story about a violinist with a gypsy background. He couldn't read or write, he was illiterate. He grew up in the slums, but he had one gift. When he played the violin, time stopped. Have you met some of those people that just have a talent? And this talent took him to the palaces all over Europe. He was playing at King, King's birthdays and in every concert hall and he recorded records and he became a celebrity in Europe. In his 70s, he went to buy a new violin, but known everywhere. The guy couldn't read or write. He came from the poorest backgrounds in the slums, but he was a master violinist. Came to the shop in Vienna, in Austria, to buy a new violin. And he tried out violin after violin from Japan, from Hungary, from everywhere. And he wasn't pleased with them. Had them between his chin and, you know, his chest and try them out with his bow. He wasn't pleased with them. So after a while he said, I need to go to the restroom. And they said, well, you have to go through the workshop out in the backyard. There is an outhouse. So he walked through the workshop where they were making the violins. And uh, as he came out, was just about to go into the outhouse. Everyone in South Europe knows the story. I, I hope you will never forget it once you've heard it. Next to the outhouse was an ash heap. That's where they burned their trash. They did that back in the days in Europe. We do that in Africa to this day. Once a week we pour some gasoline on that, ash, on that trash pile in the backyard. And we burn our trash. And on the top of this ash heap was a broken violin with only one string holes everywhere cracked and he couldn't pass it his eyes were drawn to it so he picked it up put it between his chin and his chest and tried it out with his bow and started making music and how many of you know a master violin can play on one string doesn't matter if there are holes and cracks right he started making music and before he knew he was forgetting about everyone else and started playing away fiddling away and they came out from the workshop and from the shop and everyone was admiring how he was playing on a piece of trash so beautifully the story goes that he paid for this piece of trash as much as for the most expensive violin in the shop and he refused to take an offer and answer they said you can take it it's just a piece of trash it was going to be burned tomorrow no 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 I want to pay the highest price for it and he did and for the remainder of his career he never or he refused to play on any other instrument than on this broken violin with one string I love this story he played in every concert hall and in every palace on a broken violin with holes everywhere and cracks with one string. And on his deathbed, his daughter was asking him, Daddy, why did you end your career like that? Why? You were the best violinist in Europe. And he said, I had to. Because I needed to give something back to God who picked me off my ash heap. When God found me in the slums, I was illiterate, I had nothing, I just had this one gift and he picked me off the ash heap. I had holes and I had cracks and I had one string, but the Lord has been playing on me for 50 years. I needed to play on this piece of trash to give tribute to God just before I was taken. When I heard that story the first time as a kid, I cried. But I'm thinking about this story so often when I'm sitting behind backstage somewhere in a crowd of 80,000 or 100,000 is waiting for me to preach and all I can feel is not again I can't do this this is not working for me but I, I would like to say to you and you know what that music says now finish up your sermon but I'm an evangelist I'm used to dogs barking and demons screaming. That music won't do it, brother. <laughs> I love you, man. I love you. This is a great. 
Hey. Every time when he doesn't play, I cry. And when he plays too much, I cry. Some holes are still there. And they give me, give me that very special sound. Some holes he has not even repaired. And I think he's not going to. Seems that he's using them. Because he needs some of those holes there in order for me to reach those people that didn't grow up in church. Right? Some of them he has healed. But I can tell you, I feel like that broken violin. One string, cracks and holes everywhere, but in the master's hands. So when you think about a fresh start and big dreams, all I can say is, put your life on the potter's wheel. Use this conference to put your life on the altar of God. Put your life right there into His firm hands and allow Him to work you over. Hallelujah. Sometimes you don't need another two, three strings. You just need that one to be tuned. Because when you are in His hands, hallelujah, He will make music. And I want to speak to each and everyone in here that feels insignificant or you feel like you have crashed or you feel like you're not fit for ministry. You might be more fit for ministry now than you have ever been. Finally, the Lord says, I can pick him off that ash heap and put him in my hands and start to make some real music with that someone. As long as there is strings of ambition and pride and fame and glory and this and that the master can't play songs are going to be about you and the melodies are going to be about you but they need to be about Jesus and they need to give a tribute to Jesus when I've been praying and praying for all of you and when Jeff said I'm giving you that session there to you know to to tie it up and then I will just come up and put a little bit of the icing on the cake I asked Holy Spirit Holy Spirit Holy Spirit what is the message in this conference what is it that you want to say in this Ignite conference and I think that we all need a fresh start but in order for us to get a fresh start we need to crash and if you feel like I'm praying that God don't crush me take this away you should you should rephrase your prayer take everything Lord take me take my wife take my kids take everything I am all that I care about is to be in your hands a couple of more years if you can use me play if you can use me use my life to give a tribute to you preaching the gospel is the most beautiful thing that there is but in order for you to be a pure vessel for Jesus he needs to take away all that stuff that has to do with you so that's only Jesus that shines through Jesus are not coming to your judge is coming to his judge to his bride we are just caretakers right watching over his bride right we're just there we be just put in there to watch over something that doesn't even belong to us that belongs to him we're not preaching our own messages we don't need to be unique we need to preach his message and what he says and we need to be instruments in his hands I heard the Holy Spirit as I was preparing and as I was coming over here to preach to you in this session I heard the Holy Spirit say I want to give birth to my dreams in their lives wild big amazing dreams 
But in Africa, our first sound equipment had to burn to the ground for God to give us something that was five times bigger. And in Africa, we had to lose team members and go through hell and all kinds of things in order for God to give us that team that he could finally use for his glory. I'm going into this year and I prayed yesterday, here I am. Take me, take my wife, take my kids, take everything I am. I'm just putting myself on your potter's wheel. Work me over, work me over again and again and again. Take me in your hands, tune me with your fingers and play. And let me make music for you. Let's stand up on our feet everywhere, everywhere. The power of the Holy Spirit is about to be poured out here in a fantastic way I want you to reach out to Jesus where you're standing just reach out to Jesus and say take it all take it all your kingdom come your will be done no matter the cost if you want to see a city shaken by God if these are the prayers you've prayed or the prayers I've prayed Father let me touch a continent sometimes I'm whining back home and Maria says suit yourself <laughs> you've prayed for a continent to be touched what are you thinking every bone in your body will be crushed before a continent can be reached let's lift up our hands and say take it all just take it take it all i'm in your hands i'm clay in your hands form out of me that pottery that you want to form Remove from my life what needs to be removed. Expose in my life what needs to be exposed. Father, heal the cracks you need to heal and leave the wounds open that you need to leave open. Give me that special sound that tune that one string in my life and let me just be in your nail-marked hands and make music with me. The carpenter has got you in his hands. The potter has got you in his hands. Now lift up your hands to him and say, I'm in good hands. Hallelujah. I'm in good hands. And listen to me now. Our God is fair. Even when you don't think he is fair. You can't see the big picture. You can't see what he is doing in your life right now. But he's fair. He's just. He's wonderful. And his fingers are working you over. Now lift up your hands to a good God who is about to take you. Hallelujah. Take you into his hands. I'm telling you those big dreams that will come. Those dreams that will shake cities and nations and countries and people groups. Those dreams. Hallelujah. They, they will come when your dreams are dead. They will come when your ambitions are dead. They will come when you don't even want to preach anymore. Now I'm saying to the Lord, going into this festival season of 2024, we're going to preach all over Africa. I'm saying, if you want to play, play. If you can play better on someone else, play. Father, Father, as long as I'm in your hands, I know I'm safe. As long as I'm in your hands and in your fingers, then I know everything is going to be good. He tunes you right now. Hallelujah. Lift up your hands to Jesus. I can see Jesus walking all over this room. Jesus is in this room. The carpenter is here. He comes to your boat, comes to your nets. He comes to you. He says, come follow me and I will make you. Come follow me and I will shape you. Come follow me and I will speak something over you and turn you into something you are not now. Father, I thank you for the transformation process in the death process that is Christianity. Father, I thank you for what you are about to do through this conference here. For what you are going to give birth to in city after city. Real revivals, real outpourings. Jesus being seen by thousands and millions of people throughout America and throughout the world through the delegates that are gathered here. Tune that one string. Take them in your hands. Pick them up with your fingers. 
Jesus is coming to your ash heap. Jesus can't pass you by. Jesus is going to make music with those that think I have no sound. Hallelujah. I see Jesus walking around here now. I see Jesus at work here now. Apostles are being birthed through pain, through agony. Prophets are being birthed. There's a fire in your bones and you cannot help it but prophesy and say what the Lord has put in your heart to say. Evangelists are being birthed. Shepherds that are caring so much for the flock, they are ready to lay down their lives for the flock. Teachers that are not there to be brilliant or eloquent, but want, just want to be fair and, you know, faithful to the Word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lift up your hands. Come, 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 come. Lift up your hands. Come into the come into the holy, holy realm of the Holy Spirit. Come, come, come. Come into the anointing of God. Let visions come to us. Dreams come to us that are not our own, but are birthed in your heart. Le buri ala mende, le buri ala makari ala mengere budi ala mangara bashi kiri ele mengere beshmet basa. Meruri ala marle mengere dekiri ala harle engere ala manda ala machi ala manda ala mani ala manda. The demons will fear everything about you. The demons will run as soon as the Lord picks up His instrument from one tune. One tune that is being played on that vessel that is your life that has been hammered out. Hallelujah on the altar of God. He dips you in the fire. You are gluing hot metal. He puts you on that altar and He hammers you, works you over, turns you into a weapon. Rigiri ala mendo lo bruni ana manga ra bachi ala manga ra basik tiki ana manda la bachaka. Hallelujah! God is calling a lot of new minister gifts in this place. Apostles that will plant churches, not for a new feather in their hat, not for a new medal on their chest, but because cities are not touched by the hand of God yet, because cities have not been reached. All with the right motives. Apostles are being birthed. Called into the ministry. Jesus is standing at your boat. Jesus is saying, come follow me and I will make you. Come follow me and I will hammer. And I will chisel. And I will carve. And what is being left when I'm done with you will be the instrument. I got you in my hands says the Lord Almighty you are in my hands you got nothing to fear my hands are good my hands are fair my hands are just hallelujah father our lives are worth nothing if we are not in your hands father our lives are worth nothing if we can't give a tribute to the gospel and to the son that you allowed to die and being raised again Lift up your hands to Jesus. Lift up your hands to Jesus. And allow that anointing to sweep into your life right now. Many of you are seeing visions. There is a prophetic anointing landing in this conference right now where you are just being pregnant in the Holy Spirit and you see visions in your eyes are being opened and you see what the Lord wants to do, not what you want to do. Shigiri ala manda la machi kuri ala manda la basha karaba shigiri andle mbrumosh putbasa shigiri ala manda la mani ala mar la manda la bachi kidi gondo shigiri gida na bara la haja gondo lo brumonjo. I will turn you into my masterpiece if you will allow me to, says the Holy Spirit. 
I will turn you into an instrument with a sound that will make the whole world listen. The whole world will pay attention. But it will not be your talents. It will be when I've carved into you and when I've chiseled into you and when I've hammered you and when I've formed you. Hallelujah. Everybody say, I'm in your hands. I'm in your hands. I'm in your hands, Jesus. I'm in your hands. Do what you want to do. Do what pleases you. Hallelujah. Let's lift up our hands. Let's sing together with the worship team. Let's surrender. Let's give ourselves over to Jesus before our apostle here and our dear father and host is going to close this conference with some final sending words. So let's just go before Jesus right now and be in that moment of a prophetic anointing. Hallelujah. You will dream dreams tonight. You will see visions when you go from this place. You'll be wrapped in a cloud of glory. You will be drunk for days. I'm coming upon your life. My hands are upon your life. Let's sing something together. Let's glorify Jesus. Let's come before Jesus.